Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome, everyone, to PeakProsperity.com's Featured Voices podcast. It is July 16th, 2019. I'm your host, Dr. Chris Martinson. In a recent piece entitled, Do You Have Free Will?, I wrote about all of the data piling up showing how we tend to behave as a function of both nature and nurture, understanding how we're wired to respond to various stimuli or data or information is especially important today. This is a vital question, of course, to explore for those of us interested in introducing ideas about reality that might be troubling in nature, let's say. So we need to know, are humans, on average, wired to receive the kind of information that we think needs to be out in the world, or are we wired against it? And if so, is there anything we can do about it? Well, today's guest is an absolute center of the bowling alley strike on this one. Dr. Tally Sherritt is a professor of cognitive neuroscience in the Department of Experimental Psychology at University College London. She received her PhD in psychology and neuroscience from New York University. Dr. Sherritt is known for her research on the neural basis of emotion, decision-making, and optimism. Her book, The Influential Mind, What the Brain Reveals About Our Power to Change Others, was published highlighting the critical role of emotion in influence and the weakness of data. Perfect guest for today. I'm especially interested in that topic, of course, as someone who is constantly trying to reach people, oftentimes using data. Her 2012 TED Talk on the optimism bias has received over 2.3 million views. Welcome to the program, Dr. Sherritt. Uh, thank you for having me. Lovely, lovely to join. Uh, Dr. Sherritt, tell us uh, just a little background. How did you get interested in science and then gravitate towards your current area of expertise? Um, so I was really interested in people, which I think is quite natural. I was just interested in why people do what they do and why do I do what I do. Um, and because every kind of action or thought or feeling that, that anyone has really is triggered by the brain. It's generated by the brain. And so to understand human behavior, um, understanding the brain seemed the path to go. So, so that was kind of the, the, reason or the motivation right right up front what are the chances uh that i'm a rational individual operating with complete free will um zero <laughs> you seem so confident <laughs> so what let's i want to talk about this because i think there is a, a con a concept out there in a lot of people that we're rational beings of course economics is founded maybe f in a flawed fashion on the idea that we are rational actors but everything that i've done and studied and the more i've gone down this path of of looking at how humans are actually wired up we come with a lot of uh preconditioning a lot of wiring that nature's bestowed upon us and it 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 uh the understanding seems to pile up that maybe we're not as rational and as full of free will as we thought uh, let's go into that a bit. What What is it in human wiring, Dr. Sherritt, that is, uh, pushes us away from being rational? So really, you know, I have to kind of step back for a second. When I said, you know, you're not rational, I was kind of jumping um, into like a, a, a you know, simple answer. It's not that simple. It really, it really depends on what you mean or what a person means when they say rational. Because... Um, when you know in economics when people say people are not rational it usually means that they're making decisions that are not necessarily going to gain them the most monetary rewards um but in fact all these kind of incidences of biases and heuristics and you know decisions that seem irrational if you look at them from a different angle they could be rational. So there's two things to consider. First of all, what it is that you're trying to maximize. Because in, you know, for economists, people, they usually think, well, we're trying to maximize, you know, material outcomes. And if you look at that at that angle, then yes, we're not rational. But from, you know, a point of a psychologist, if what we're trying to maximize is, for example, effective well-being, emotional well-being, then many times these decisions that 
seem irrational are actually rational because we're trying to minimize anxiety, for example, or maximize anticipation. And the cost may be material, but that's fine. That's a decision that we make. And the other kind of thing to keep in mind is that those um, behaviors that seem irrational are actually because we're using some rules that are very good rules to use in updating our beliefs or making decisions, but um, they're not, of course, going to give us the best um, decision or the best outcome 100% of the time. So there are good rules to use because they are the benef- you know, the beneficial rule 80% of the time, but then not, you know, 20% of the time there, it isn't the best thing to do. And we kind of, as, you know, behavioral economists focus on those 20%. So I have to step back and say, you know, our, our brain and our minds are actually quite extraordinary. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's quite amazing that we can make so many decisions, you know, in just a single day and, you know, get along in this world relatively well. And we do it because, the brain is set up in a way that usually gets you, um, you know, where you're going and gets you to the best decisions. Um, so, um, we really shouldn't look at ourselves as, Oh, we're just, you know, making stupid decisions all the time. We should look at our behavior and say, well, why are we making these decisions that, you know, from our angle doesn't seem the best ones. Are we making them because we don't really understand what people really want? Maybe we're making it because we think we want one thing, but really it's another thing that we're trying to get. Is it because, um, you know, we're using a rule that's quite good, but it's not good for this instance, and that's okay. But then you didn't answer your question, but what was the question now? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> well, I want to get at um, this idea of, of how we're wired up, and so that we can understand, I, I truly believe that um, if we can become conscious and knowledgeable about the things that are actually driving us, that we have opportunities then to... Um, be aware of those. And sometimes they're very helpful and sometimes they're pitfalls for us. And so knowing when is which is, is, would be a good, a good place to start. So one of my sayings is humans are not rational. We're rationalizers. And I do this all the time, right? If I, if I become emotionally attached to a car and I want the car, I'll come up with all the rational reasons. Look at its safety, look at its mileage ratings, look at all this stuff. But the truth is the decision got made somewhere deeper in my limbic system, I think. It was made emotionally. And so that's the part I'm trying to tease apart is where are we rational and where are we making decisions driven through some other processes that are a little bit more subterranean? Not invalid. I'm not here to say good, bad, or put any judgments on it. I just want to understand how people make decisions and and, um, with the idea that maybe we could influence those decisions. Well, I mean, we we certainly can influence those decisions in many ways. Um, But first, the idea that we have two systems in our brain is a good metaphor, but it's not actually how the brain works. Um, And so, um, you know, what we call emotional system or so on, um, and what we call a rational brain, um, it's not two systems. These regions um, interact with each other all the time. They actually create subsystems together. Um, And each of these so-called systems, like an emotional system, in fact, can do very sophisticated calculations and vice versa. You know, the system that a non-neuroscience may call the rational system, the frontal cortex, can actually produce lots of biases. So we shouldn't look at it as two separate systems, as one is, you know, more, you know, biased than the other. They are both contributing Um, All regions are contributing to our decisions and um, these different regions or, you know, collection of regions uh, can do both very sophisticated and very, um, you know, superficial, use superficial rules to make decisions. And our emotions are there um, for very, very, very good reasons. Emotions are very important for our decisions because emotions convey a lot of information that we can and should use for making decisions. So if you're making decisions because, um, you know, maybe what you call an emotion, that's not necessarily a bad thing because why, why would our brain be, um, given this thing that we call emotion? It's given emotion in order to help us survive because emotion tells us what's good, what's bad, you know, how urgent, uh, an action should be. Um, so it's, it's not something that should be uh, kind of frowned upon and looked like something that we shouldn't include in our um, decision making process. In fact, people that can't experience emotion um, 
you know, or, or have um, impairments in, in those regions in the brain have a very hard time making decisions and they don't make optimal decisions. Um, and again, I think I didn't quite uh, answer the specific question, which was, um, can you repeat it for the last time? <laughs> well, it's 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 perfectly fine. We're going in the right direction. I'm trying to to build up to this idea of how we're wired and how it is that we make decisions. And again, I'm not here okay. to say that that emotional decisions are bad and rational are good. Far from it. However, I am interested in the idea that. Um, uh, as a collective human species, when we're presented with some really big challenges, mm -hmm. that getting those, that information across can be really challenging. And so uh, your work just is absolutely fascinating because it's, it's revealing the ways in which um, we actually go about making those decisions. And again, not to say good ways, bad ways, or any of that, but if we understand how we go about uh, making decisions, then we have a chance to influence those in ways both, both for our personal lives and then maybe... Uh, more collectively. So um, you started with this idea that we don't, um, that these aren't necessarily separate brains. Um, I'm, you know, aware of the idea of the triune brain that we have stacked sort of different brain functions through evolution. Um, is that is that still current knowledge? Is that how we look at the brain now that it consists of various regions of, of evolutionary design and that they um, uh, basically interact with each other that way? Um, I mean, it is true that um, as you go deeper, those um, brain regions are evolutionarily um, old. Mm -hmm. And of course, the newest ones are up there, our frontal cortex. Um, and they make us more human in the, sense of, in the sense of that it makes us uniquely human, like what makes us different from other animals. Um, so, you know, a, a greater ability to plan ahead, a greater ability, um, to do calculations and analysis and, you know, language and, and things like that. Um, so that, that is true, but, and, you know, all these systems are connected. They are a few functions that are very much specialized. You know, we know that we have a specific regions for face perception. We know that there are specific regions that are extremely important for language. If there is impaired, then we're going to have a problem. Um, but, but when it comes to decision-making and assessing risks and so on, you can't really pinpoint it into one region. Um, it's really processes that happen all over um, in quite a few regions in the brain um, in order to come up with, you know, a decision whether you want to choose A or you want to choose B, you know, and definitely the sort of financial decisions and personal decisions that we make will involve a whole host of regions kind of working together in an orchestra to come up with the action and the choice that you're going to make. So let's talk then about, um, I was really fascinated by your uh, TED Talk 2012. What, what is the optimism bias? So the optimism bias is people's uh, tendency to expect the future to be better than the past and the present, and our tendency to overestimate the likelihood of positive events in our lives, like a successful marriage or having talented kids or um, successful in, in your profession, and to underestimate the likelihood of negative events, like the likelihood that you would get divorced or have cancer or be in an accident. Um, and we find that about 80% of the population has this optimism bias. That, and there's a few important things to kind of remember about the optimism bias. First of all, it's very much about your personal future. Your future, perhaps the future of your family and, and you know, very close friends and, and kids. But it's not about uh, the future of the world or society or the country. In fact, um, we often find that there's something called private optimism but public despair, where people mm. are quite optimistic about their own future, but not necessarily about the future of humanity or, you know, the future of uh, citizens in their country in general. One reason for that is a sense of control. So uh, people have a sense that ha they have control over their own life um, and therefore they can steer the wheel in the right direction. And if we have control over our own life, we think, well, we're going to steer the, the wheel, you know, in towards the good future. Uh, and that, make that makes us optimistic. When we feel we have control, we're more likely to be optimistic because we say, well, you know, I'm going to be healthy because I'm going to do the right things to make me you know, healthy. But we don't necessarily have a sense that we have control over the uh, future of our country or the world and so on. And so in those cases, we don't necessarily have as much 
optimism as we do about our, our own future, which is why you often see people being very pessimistic about, you know, a host of, of different things, such as politics and so on. And that comes from, uh, if, I, if I got that right, this uh, sense of agency or control. And how, how does that feed into that sense of agency and control? How does that uh, feed into the optimism bias? Right. So as I, as I mentioned, is, is if you believe you have control over your future, you know, you start a company and you think, well, I, you know, whether the company succeeds or doesn't succeed has a lot to do with my own action. Right. If you believe that you basically believe that you have control over the destiny of your company, then you will be optimistic because you think I can do what is needed to succeed. But let's say you are someone who's starting a company and you think I don't have any control over where the company will go. And therefore, there's less reason for you to be optimistic. Yeah. So that's that's why the two things are related. All right. And let's talk about, say, I know a guy, um, serial entrepreneur. He's he's uh, he's managed to not be successful at every company he started. He's very optimistic. So let's talk about uh, how data or information feeds back into the optimism bias. Right. So so far, we talked about why a sense of control can make you optimistic. But there's mm-hmm. other mechanisms that generate optimism. And one of the mechanisms is uh, one that we discovered if Um, back in 2011, which is that you learn a little bit better from information that suggests positive future versus information that suggests negative Mm. things about the future. Um, And so, for example, if I were to, you would think, you know, my likelihood of succeeding with this company is 70%. And I would look at all the data and I'd say, listen, according to what I'm looking, you know, maybe it's 50%. So I'm giving you bad news. I'm telling you it's less likely that you would succeed than you thought. What we see is that people update their belief a little bit, but not a lot. They might say, well, maybe my likelihood is 65. So you thought it was 70, but you thought, well, maybe it's 65% now. However, if I told you, I looked at your data and I said, look, I think your company is, it's not 70% likely to succeed. It's 90% likely to succeed. At that point, I'm giving you good news. And what we find is that people take good news and really change their beliefs quite quickly. And you would say, well, okay, well, maybe it's like 87%. So you're much more likely to alter your belief and change it when I'm giving you information that's good about the future that you didn't expect versus information that's bad. And um, when we looked at um, how the brain responds to that kind of good and bad news, we found that the brain, especially parts of of the frontal uh, cortex, um, encode information that suggests good news better than information that suggests bad news. So we encode good and bad news, but most of us on average encode the good news a little bit better than the bad news. And so we use it to alter our beliefs. Um, And in fact, we could change how people process information by interrupting with these brain regions that encode information. So we could use um, a, uh, a method that we have where we pass a little magnetic pulse for the scalp of a participant into a certain region of the brain in the frontal cortex and then we interfere with that brain engine. And by doing that, we can actually interfere with the way that people process information. And we can do it where we only interfere with how you process the good news or mainly how you process the good news. And we can also do it in a way that we interfere mainly with how you process the bad news. Oh, well, that's fascinating. So what happens when you uh, interfere with the, the region where somebody's processing good news? Right. So they would um, process good news a little bit less. Um, and when we interfere with a part of the, re- the part of the brain that we, in this specific instant, was processing bad news, they would encode it a little bit less. And so, and so that bias you talked about, where where they would adjust their percentages, they wouldn't adjust them quite as far. In is that would would that be the? Yeah, so, so you can play you can play around with the bias if if uh-huh. an or, you know if a, a, you know you're a typical person learns more from bad for good news and bad news, and then you interfere with a part of the brain that was encoding good news, then of course the amount that they would learn from good news goes down. And therefore, now you don't have um, as much of a bias or a bias at all. Now, is this a very specific region, like you would say, like uh, facial recognition or the ability to speak or something like that? This is a, a part of the brain that's, uh, that is it dedicated to this task? Um, yeah, so it's, it's, I mean, in our case, we knew exactly what brain region was encoding the type of information that we were giving a person in a specific task. And so we could interfere with that region. It's not necessarily the only region that's doing it. Mm-hmm. And again, it's part of a system, but it's one that our um, brain imaging studies suggested is very important. 
And so we can interfere with that specific one. But, um, you know, I wouldn't call it a, a good news region or a bad news region. It's it's whether it's a specific region that is doing that job does matter. And things like, oh, how am I presenting the information? For example, I presented numbers or I verbally told you something or, you know, what you had to do. So, um so we can identify specific regions that are really important in specific contexts and situations. Um, but I wouldn't then go ahead and say this region is a good news region in the brain or that region is a bad news region in the brain. All right. Fascinating. Well, but evolution has, has uh, decided this is a, a thing worth, um, worth giving us. And there must be a lot of pros to the optimism bias. What, what are those? Um, right. So, um, if, you know, if you think the future is bright, then um, it reduces your anxiety and that's really good for both your mental health and your physical health. Uh, in fact, we find that people that don't have an optimism bias, a lot of those people tend to have a depression. Um, and we um, people has, have also found that optimists are um, more likely to succeed in different professions, whether it's in business or sports or politics, because if you are an optimist and you think, well, you know, I'm likely to succeed, then what you do is put more effort into it, right? If you think, well, my company is definitely going to succeed or is likely to succeed, then you, it motivates you to work hard. But if you think, well, nothing I do is going to help. This is just going to, you know, it's a lost cause. I'm going to not, the company is not going to succeed when then you're less likely to put effort into it. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So to be clear, it doesn't become a self-fulfilling prophecy just because we had a thought, but your thought will change your actions and your actions can of course change outcomes in the world. Yeah. Um, and that's why optimism is related to success because it enhances motivation. All right. So health and well-being. Um, any downsides? Yeah. So if we underestimate risk, then we're less likely to take precautionary action. So if you think, um, well, I'm, you know, I uh, am going to be so healthy that you don't even like go to medical screenings or um, you don't buy insurance when you actually should. Right. That's a problem. You don't prepare for the worst case scenario. That's a problem. Um so there's two things here to say. One is that most people are mildly optimistic. So they um, they don't necessarily think, oh, this is never going to happen to me. It's just that they underestimate the likelihood. That's first thing. And the second thing to say is that we found something interesting um, quite recently. We published this last year. The problem that we kind of like started talking about here is that, okay, optimism is good for many reasons, but then it could be quite negative, right? You're underestimating risk. In fact, for example, people have said that the financial collapse of, of 2008 is partially because of the optimism bias. People overestimating um, how the economy will do, people overestimating, you know, their ability to pay mortgages and so on and so forth. And so, um, you know, optimism bias of a lot of people was one of the reasons creating the uh, the downfall. So there's negative things to hear. And so um, it was commonly thought by psychologists and philosophers that, okay, there are advantages to optimism bias, there's disadvantages, but probably, if you probably look at everything together, probably the advantages are simply more than the disadvantages. And that's why we have the optimism bias. But um, what we found recently is that the optimism bias can disappear quite quickly in environments where it should disappear, where it's probably advantage, advantageous not to have it. And then it comes back in other environments. So in relatively safe environments, like the one that you and I are in today, on average, the optimism bias is probably quite helpful. It keeps you your mind at rest. It um, enhances your motivation. But if I put you in a really threatening environment, you know, I'm going to put you out. There's like lions around and so on. You really don't want to underestimate your risk at all. Right. And so in those environments, it might be better not to have an optimism bias at all. And we found that that is likely what happens. So when we thought, well, we're going to take people. And of course, we can't put them in a threatening environment with like hungry lions around, but we will put them in a threatening environment where they feel quite stressed. And we're going to test whether under those environments, the optimism bias goes away. And so what we did is we told people 
that they're going to have to give a speech in front of everyone else on a surprise topic that we would give them no time to prepare. We would videotape them. We would put it on YouTube. The idea is just to create a threatening environment where people are stressed. And the idea was, would this stress change the way you process information and therefore make the optimism bias go away? And that's exactly what we found, that under threat, under stress, people started learning from unexpected negative information much better than they did before. So if you told someone, you know, you think the likelihood of, of your uh, company succeeding is 70 and we told them, oh, it's only about 50, they would learn a lot from that under stress. They would change your belief quite a lot. Um, but if you then, if you didn't, if you just put them in a relaxed environment, back to the optimism bias, learn more from positive than negative. We did the same with firefighters in the state of Colorado. The idea is that, um, firefighters have quite diverse days. So some days they're in just sitting in the station and it's quite relaxed and quite safe, but some days they actually have to go out and there's life threatening events. And we found that when the firefighters, we had the firefighters do our experiments and we found that they were under stress the optimism bias went away. They learned quite well from negative information, equally well to positive. But when they were relaxed, they learned less well from negative than from positive, and the bias was there. Um, so this means that the optimism bias is not just adaptive because it has more advantages to disadvantages on average. It's adaptive because it can come and go in different environments in a way that makes it adaptive. So this raises a couple of things. Uh, first, we've noticed this bias ourselves. For instance, um, the worst time to try and buy a generator is when a hurricane's coming, and the best time is about a month after it's passed. It takes about 30 to 60 days, and people forget, and they don't need these things anymore, and they don't want to be prepared for the next one. And, and so it, it, it goes away very quickly. But this is an important point here during times of calm. And so this is getting to the heart of, of whether this is evolutionarily helpful or not, uh, humans have come through an extraordinary arc where we're up at 7.6, 7.8 billion people now. There's no fresh continents. We've kind of run through things. We are, in the animals we eat, 95% of the biomass of, of animals on, on the surface of the planet. So we're now at the edge of our of our cradle, as it were. And uh, we need to start making some really big, uh, big collective decisions around things like climate change or the dwindling of fossil fuels eventually or soils or ecology, things like that. How, how, given the fact that we have the optimism bias, given that there are people out there like myself who think we need to begin motivating towards some uh, fairly large, long distant thing, which we might not feel a lot of agency around to combine a few things we've talked about, how, what, what, what would be the do's and don'ts of, of beginning conversations where you're, say, for example, interested in alerting people to climate change in a way that would actually lead to action? All right. Yeah, so climate change is, is an extremely problematic um, issue because the only way for us to understand it is kind of to think about things that are not in front of us, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, we can see it's a little bit, you know, like, you know, a little bit hotter summer, or, you know, more snow than usual, but you know, our environment feels quite safe. Um, it feels quite pleasant, and so there's not an immediate danger in front of us. There's not an immediate, I mean, that we can actually see and feel, right? That our brain can actually process as, you know, stimuli coming in. Um, and so we feel like we are in a safe environment. We're quite relaxed. And the only way for us to understand the dangers is to try to process them in this abstract way to try and like think about these numbers of what could happen in the future. Um, and that's really problematic because those numbers on their own, you know, are not necessarily going to change the way that we process information and stress us out and, and cause us to change action. Um, it's something that we have to imagine in our mind and imagine something that we've never seen before. This is extremely difficult. Um, the other difficulty is that we, um, most of the real, real negative effects are not going to happen to us in our lifetime, maybe to our kids, you know, but um, that's another problem that people think, well, it's, especially depending on how old you are. But um, in, at a certain age, you think, well, it's not going to affect me directly. And that's another problem, right? You need, you're need you asking people to make decisions on things that are going to affect future generations. That's another problem. Um, and finally, in order to think about climate change, we're really asking people to think about the bad stuff, right? 
Mm-hmm. We're trying to them, asking them to think about the dangers and all the catastrophe that could happen in the future. People don't like to go towards the bad stuff. Um, we have this kind of avoid approach instinct where we approach the good things, whether it's, you know, chocolate cake or money or love. We kind of move forward. We approach. If you see a, per, a, a photo with a smiling person, you approach. Or if you see a smiling person, you approach. When we see the bad stuff, we kind of try to go back, avoid and not not get close to it, whether it's poison or someone frowning or any kind of danger. We just stay away and we don't. Um, in fact, it's been shown, for example, that if you try to get um, people to kind of donate money, let's say in one of those GoFundMe things or, 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 or that kind of sort, if you have someone um, that is smiling and showing positive valence, uh, people are more more likely to put money for, for that individual than someone that looks sad or distressed, even if the money is for, you know, to help someone who's sick. Um, but showing a person that is um, has a positive valence is more likely to get people to contribute the negative valence. So that's a, another problem with uh, climate change. Uh, and finally, we have the problem of control because we don't really feel that we have much control over climate change as an individual, right? It's really hard to convince people that that they have control. Um, so those are all kind of the pr- the, peop- the problems. And that is, you know, ignoring for a second that the whole thing that, that some people don't believe in it in general, right? Um, for different reasons as well. So I think in order to um, get to action, we need to kind of reframe the problem, not as we're going into um, extinction, we're going into a catastrophe, we need to do something now to avoid it, but more like, what can we do to make our planet as, you know, as good as it's been? What can we do to protect it and make it uh, a place that is flourishing? to kind of try to insert a positive message um, rather than a negative in order to people to want to approach and take action and to be involved rather than people say, I don't want to think about this bad stuff because it, you know, it's not something nice to think about. Um, and I think that's something that hasn't been done so much. The focus has mostly been on uh, trying to scare and trying to cause fear um, rather than trying to enhance the sense that we can create something that's great for future generations. And, you know, it's something that at least is worth examining, whether that kind of message. That's a great point. I learned from George Lakoff. He wrote, uh, Don't Think of an Elephant, other pieces like that. And um, we were uh, discussing how to... Um, uh, something along these lines, but he was he he used a, a, a great metaphor. He said, "Look, when when Obama released uh, the idea of the Affordable Care Act, uh, he made a he, he goofed because he acted as the COO rather than the CEO. He came out and said we need to control rising health care costs. So that's a tactic, and uh, you know it's it's operational. Instead, if he'd reframed it as the CEO is in terms of vision and and put it in a moral term. So if he said." People deserve access to health care when they need it, right? Mm-hmm. Then then it's harder for the sides to get out their machine guns and go at it. But as soon as you put a tactic out there, like you say, we have to control uh, the temperature needs to stay under two degrees. Well, I don't know what that means personally, and I've studied this, um, you know, what that would mean to me personally. So is there, uh, what, what would your research say? What is, what's happening when we frame something in terms of data versus at the moral level, if I could use that? Well... Well, I mean, so the moral level is more um, highlighting our motivations and goals, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Not you don't even have to think about it as moral, but just what goal are we going towards, right? Um, How do we want things to be? Um, that's something that that very much motivates people. Uh, yes, it's still problematic when the goal is way in the future and perhaps not in our lifetime. But I mean, you can have sub goals that can be in our lifetime, right? Um, and I mean, a lot of them are. So if, if if action will be taken now, we will see consequences in the near future. So um, goals is, is definitely something that motivates people. We, I mean, it's you know, it's kind of like playing a. Uh, one of those online games. There's like a goal, and we and and even though the goal doesn't really doesn't mean it matter for anything, people get oh so involved in it and want to reach it. 
So that's definitely um, a great way, a great way to motivate people. Um, another great way is to um, highlight the immediate rewards. So what, what I talked about before is framing it as something that is, you know, trying to make the world that's better for everyone and future generations and so on. But we could also think about it. What is the immediate rewards that we can get by taking action now? Right. How would it improve your life now or in the next few weeks or a few months or, you know, a year? Um, and, you know, I'm sure that there are some rewards that people could um, get if they take action now. Now, those rewards are also some things that you can make up. So, for example, I know that in our department in the university, um, you know, departments that are more green get, you know, a uh, little extra points at the end, they win, you know, best green department or whatever, and they get some kind of prize. And so this seems a little bit silly, but it's hugely motivating. Um, you know, a lot of people in the department, the whole administrative group and so on to take action and putting in more recycling bins and so on and so forth. Um, because, those things are just another, you know, we're humans and we're, we're kind of designed in a certain way uh, to pursue goals and to pursue ones that are closer in, in, in time. So um, that's another kind of thing to think about. How will it um, be advantageous for us, not only for future generations? Because I think that really is another motivator. All right. Um, well, that all makes sense. Now, uh, the question that springs to mind, I, I was quite taken with the whole idea of the backfire effect. It seems to be um, pretty robust, and I think I've observed it in action quite a bit. So um, are is the backfire effect a, a real thing, as I've come to understand it, that, that when presented with information that counters a cherished belief, people will often use that countervailing information to actually strengthen their positions rather than reduce them? Yeah. So, a, you know, the one thing just to say before we kind of talk about it is in um, the brain is the um, our behavior, we would say, is the outcome of a lot, a lot of rules. Right. And um, but we don't have one strong rule like gravity, you know, physics, you have like you know, for gravity, gravity is like something that is true in, in all these different contexts and so on. Um, in psychology, things are a little bit more subtle. And there's a lot of different pushes and pulls on our brain and our behavior. Um, and so I, you know, the backfire effect is something that you can definitely observe a lot of the time. But just to say that it doesn't mean that every single time for every single person under every single situation, you would see that. Um, okay. So that being said, um, yes, there's a lot of demonstrations of it. And we could, as you said, you know, people um, have can see it in their own life and interacting with other people that if someone has a very strong uh, position or a very strong belief and you come at them with something, you know, new and say, well, you know, you're wrong and here's the reason why you're wrong, our automatic reaction is to try to protect our belief, especially if that belief is very much tied to our identity, but not even, even if it's, you know, just a choice that we made. We have um, a study that we've done quite recently where, um, we wanted to see what happens in the brain when you encounter an opinion that doesn't really confirm to your own. And we wanted those opinions to really not be part of your identity. We wanted it to be something super simple. Um, and so we had people make decisions together about um, the value of real estate, right? We had them like look at different real estate and evaluate it. And while they were doing that, we also scanned their brains in two brain imaging scanners, but they could interact over the Wi-Fi. So they could see the opinions of the other person and they could respond using button boxes and so on. And what we found is what, when a person um, saw that the other person is agreeing with them on the price of real estate, each person's brain really encoded the information coming from the agreeing partner quite well. So using statistics, we could see that the activity in the brain suggests that you're really taking in what the other person is saying when they are agreeing with you. And people's confidence in their own decision went up, which makes sense because if someone agrees with me, I become more confident. But then what was interesting was when two people disagreed, it basically looked like the brain was kind of shutting down. and It wasn't even encoding the information coming from the disagreeing partner. So you thought the value of the real estate is, you know, very high. And the other person says, no, it's low. And, you know, giving you uh, extra information at that point, 
you're not even encoding it anymore. You're saying, well, they're just, you know, they're just wrong. And so I'm not even going to encode this information, not necessarily doing this con consciously, but that's what happened. And then what happened to people's confidence when someone disagreed with them, it didn't change much. There was a tiny, small reduction, but not even a significant one. Um, so that really shows us that um, coming in with you know reasons to defend your own position and suggest that the other person is wrong may just be ignored altogether. Right. I might just not listen to you altogether. Or um, I may at the same time, you know, while you're even talking, come up with other reasons to strengthen my my decision and my choice, my assessment. Well, that's fascinating. So in, in these are with lightly held beliefs. Um, in the case of if we went to something fairly strongly held where it was, I don't know, religious based or, you know, climate change really for or against um, either way. But if if. If we took somebody with a really strongly held belief, would would you say that the encoding function, uh, would you guess it would disappear there as well? And would it actually go further and be resisted? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We, I, you know, we, we on purpose chose something that was, you know, wasn't kind of a strong emotional belief that you had. Um but just, you know, you, you've made some kind of assessment about real estate. Definitely, if we went for something that is uh, ideologically important for people, we would see, I think, much stronger um, effects as well. Interesting. So it, what's the how tell me the evolutionary um, advantage of this? Right. So, I mean, this goes back to what's known as a confirmation bias. And the confirmation bias is our tendency to take in information that confirms what we believe and to um, be a bit critical of information that doesn't confirm what we believe. And the um, on average, you know, this is exactly the right way to alter your beliefs, because on average, if you have strong beliefs, um, those beliefs are likely to be correct on average. Um, and if I come, you know, if I come and tell you now I saw pink elephants flying in the sky, then you would just ignore me altogether, you know, think I'm delusional or I'm lying as you should because you have a strong belief that elephants don't fly in the sky. And when you decide whether you're going to update your beliefs or not, it depends on your belief that you already hold and your confidence in that belief. And it would be a very bad idea if you went around the world every day and every time that you saw a piece of information or opinion that dis you know that that was counter to what you believe, you'd change your belief, right? I mean that would that would be a very bad way to go about life, and it will create chaos. And so our brain is what call, is called Bayesian. Right? We, we, whether we update our beliefs or not, depends on what we already believe. Um, and that's a good way to go. And in most cases, it gets us to the right place. And again, it doesn't mean that we don't update at all. It's just that we update much less when we already, when it counters to what we believe. But of course, the problem is those situations when our belief is very strong, but it is false, right? And in those situations, it's really hard to change people's false beliefs because the same mechanism that we use to update our beliefs about everything in the world um, is the ones that we're going to use for these false beliefs as well. Um, and that's and, and I think that's kind of the cases that a lot of times psychologists concentrate on or behavioral econ uh, economists concentrate on. Um, those kind of instances where it seems very suboptimal, but 80% of the time we are doing it right. Interesting. Okay. So, um, the question that emerges for me, uh, then would be, um, let's, let's assume that, that there's some people out there, maybe myself who are interested in, um, uh, who completely understand that you can't just go around revising your beliefs with every new piece of information. But if you wanted to have a more flexible approach or maybe have these things be more at the surface area, uh, practices like um, meditation or uh, some of the really fascinating stuff that's emerged with the ability of uh, psilocybin to really shake people's belief structures and, and move them. Um, what are some of the, the ways that people can go about uh, developing a more flexible or balanced uh, ability to process and take in information? Well, um, I think, first of all, just being aware is helpful to some degree, mm -hmm. right? So being a bit critical of how you are updating and so on. Um, a relatively, so there's two points where confirmation bias kind of come, comes about. First is what information we even see, right? 
which information do we even encounter, regardless of whether we're going to believe it or not? Uh, what information are you actually evaluating? Because we have a bias that we're more likely to seek the information that already confirms what we believe, right? And that creates a bias because the information that is in front of you is already biased because you're more likely to kind of, you know, uh, you know, try to like ask the opinions of people that you know are probably likely to agree with you, more likely to, you know, have a Google search that will um, actually generate the information that you already agree with. And so those, the kind of the bias and in information that is in front of you is a little bit easier to alter because you could do things like, um, follow people that you know are on the other side of a lot of beliefs that you have on social media and so on. So people that you respect but are not necessarily going to agree with you. Have people in your team that you know hold different views and theories um, that are relevant to whatever the profession is. Um, disable um, the Google um, features that is more likely to give you what you kind of already believe and so on. So that's the first, the first step. The first step is to try to at least have diversity of information in front of you um, as a first step. And then, of course, the second step is which information you're going to uh, use to alter your beliefs. I think it's very difficult to do this on yourself, on your own, i.e. to cause yourself to um, to be open to information that, that uh, dis that is not um, confirming what you believe. But I think what is a little bit easier um, is to try to present information to people that disagree with you in order to have them be more likely to uh, consider it. And I think the way to do it is that even when you disagree with some, someone, whether it's a political argument or even, you know, a personal argument with a, a spouse or something on something that we disagree on. I think one way to go is to try, first of all, to figure out what actually you have in common. What belief do you already have in common? What motivation do you have in common? And start with that. Because if you present yourself as an agreeing partner, well, our study suggests that the other side is going to be more likely to open and listen and encode, right? So if you come in as, well, you know, I'm, you know, also a parent, I'm also whatever, I also want the best for our kid or something like that. Well, then you are starting off with things that you have in common. And then the other side is more likely to listen when you then give information that maybe doesn't agree as much with some kind of beliefs that they have. Um, and I, so I think that is, um, something that we could use um, in order to get our message um, across in a way that is less likely to be disregarded. So if, if I can uh, synthesize what I've heard pertaining from all the way from the climate change to here is, is that uh, because of our inherent confirmation biases and optimism biases that are built in, that it's important for us to have uh, messages that are um, positively framed, that speak to the goal involved, uh, that avoid the fear, that avoid um, the images of sickness in the case of the GoFundMe page, um, but that that were that people instinctively are are going to respond to those positive messages uh, much more rapidly and possibly better than they would a negative message, even though you're you're still trying to get to the same place with both sets of messages. Yeah, and just to be clear, because a lot of time people um, kind of misunderstand what is meant when I say positive messages. It doesn't mean to say everything's fine or everything's going to be okay. Not at all. It doesn't mean to sugarcoat anything. But it's simply to say what needs to be done to get better rather than to say what is, you know, what if we don't do this, things will get worse, right? So for example, you know, instead of telling someone, if you take route A, you will lose time and money, you would say, if you take route B, you will gain time and money. So highlight to people what has to be done in order to get to the good place that you want to get to, rather than focusing on, you know, the disaster of, oh, this is kind of the bad, the bad place that we're in, right? If you're trying to, for even if you're, you know, you might say to a kid, you might try maybe even as a second approach, instead of telling a kid, well, if you smoke, you get cancer. And they're like, well, cancer, that's way in the future. It's a bad thing. You know, my, I'm probably like, like less likely to have it. Instead of that, you might say, well, if you don't smoke, you're more likely to get in the basketball team, right? So highlight how we would get to the goals that we want to get, which is actually our intention. You know, when we try to tell to 
to scare people and so on. We're trying to do that because we want them to get to the good place. But for some reason, we're not highlighting what this good place is. Mm, fascinating. Oh, that that uh, raises a bunch of questions. And however, that is our time for today. So Dr. Tally Sherritt, thank you so much for your time today and your fascinating insights. Please, if you would, tell people how they can follow your work, um, find your books if they want to dig deeper. Sure. So the, the books are on Amazon or anywhere else where they send, send, uh, sell books. So it's The uh, Influential Mind um, and The Optimism Bias. And our website also has our um, both articles, scientific articles, but also articles for you know the, the wide population. So it's um, effectivebrain.com and effective with a, effectivebrain.com. Effective with an A dot com. Uh, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you so much for your time today. And for everybody else listening, this brings us to the end of this Featured Voices podcast. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for having me.